Hello, hello. See, I told you guys yesterday I would be back. All right, so we're gonna cover a couple things in regards to um, accommodations and modifications, especially because those may be changing soon when your kids go back to school. So it's important to talk about it right now. All right, so for those of you out there who do not know me, um, my name is Raven Woods. I'm an IEP advocate and special education consultant, and I help parents gain the knowledge and the confidence to become the CEO of their IEP meeting. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the hierarchy of accommodations and modifications. Have you ever heard of that? So we're going to be talking about that. But before we get started, click notifications above so you know when I go live. You'll be notified. And whether you get on or not, you at least know that I am going live. Number two, you want to make sure you hop over to the group at Autism Mama Rocks, the IEP group, and definitely join us over there. Okay, that's where all the conversation happens. That's where parents talk about their needs and what's going on. Okay. So today we are going to talk about, oh, really quick, post a one below if it's your first through third time you're watching me and post a two below if you're an oldie but goodie. So a one below if you're new, I want to get to know you, say hello. And if you're an oldie but goodie, post a two below and you guys know what to do. So today we are going to talk about what's called the hierarchy of accommodations and modifications. Okay, so as we're in this kind of standstill, we are accommodating our children, ourselves, and we're hopefully doing the very best we can. And we're moving forward in regards to um, helping them learn and doing the very best we can. Unless you guys have that mandated virtual learning, you lucky ducks. Um, many of us have what's called distance learning, and that's a little bit more difficult. So when your kids go back to school, you know, we talked about yesterday, make sure you get an IEE and evaluation so you know where your kid is, you know their present level of academic achievement and functional performance. So the evaluation that you want to get before your child goes back to school is a psychoeducational evaluation. That's your psych psychological evaluation combined with the educational piece. All right. And then you want to also get any type of service assessment that you possibly can. So if your child is already in speech or OT or PT or dance or music therapy, make sure that you get an assessment in that area. And I've been recording my service accommodation and modification mini course. And we were talking about how in depth we can get in regards to all the services, modifications and accommodations that parents don't even know about. They think it's just PT, OT, speech, you know, all those kind and that that's it. And there's so much more, it's, it's insane. There's just a plethora of amount of things that you can put in your IEP as services, accommodations and modifications, just like you can put anything into an IEP. So it's crazy. All right, <clears throat> so in the hierarchy, hierarchy, however you say it, um, there's layers based on their effect on the general curriculum. All right. So for example, layer zero is students, um, do the same assignment. There's really no accommodation or modification, right? Um, so there's no changes. Uh, level one is like minimal classroom changes, very minimal. And so that could be all students do basically the same assignment except some receive additional support or reinforcements, okay? So that's like a minimal accommodation in the hierarchy of accommodations and modifications. And sometimes they're even labeled so that it's, it's known in the educational um, arena as to that, that teacher and those particular teachers that are having to accommodate the student. So, for a le level one accommodation and modification on the hierarchy, okay, these are levels, they're layers basically, um, the, great, the, the changes are just minimal um, and, and it could be the same for everyone, it may not be. So you have level two, okay, which is classroom changes. There's your child needs classroom changes, all right? So that's all students learn the same basic content 
okay, which is accommodations, all right, and could be complex accommodations, and except with changes in how it's learned or tested. So again, accommodations, if you guys don't know the difference, accommodations is the child is still doing everything that any other child in that classroom with no disability is doing. They're just accommodated in a different way. So that could be, you know, more time on a test, et cetera. Minimal accommodations, okay, that they're doing to help them have educational success, but accommodations is basically accommodating the situation but not changing the situation, okay? So the grading criteria, though, may slightly differ, all right? So that's layer two of the hierarchy of accommodations and modifications. So layer three is some changes to the curriculum. So level two is changes to the classroom, all right? So level three in the hierarchy of accommodations and modifications is changes to the curriculum. So what is that? The teaching, how it's done, all right? So some students do reduced or similar assignments, but at a less frustrating level. This is again a accommodation and modification. So levels one and two are accommodations. Levels three below are accommodations and modifications. Modifications is a change too. So anything that is done in the general education classroom, if there's a modification that the whole concept of what's being done is different or it's also different and, I guess I should say, is also different from um, what the other children are doing, the gen edge students, typical students, children with non-disabilities, whatever you want to call them. They're called different types of things in the educational arena of verbiage. Um, don't forget, guys, to say hello. And if you're the first through third time watching me, post a one below at two below if you're an oldie but goodie. Make sure you say hello. It's 8.49 p.m. There's hardly anybody on here right now. So all you replayers, post a one below if you're new, two below if you're an oldie but goodie. And don't forget to click notifications. All right. So again, two is classroom changes. It's modifications along with level one. Level three is curriculum changes, which includes accommodations and modifications, okay? And these are important to know because you're gonna have to address this when your child goes back to school. There's gonna be so many differences once you go back to school because your children may need something different. Hey, Grace, how are you? So knowing that you're, you're, you're dealing with a six month of a gap here, that's not saying that you're not doing your job in teaching your child. Not at all. But accommodating them in going back to school, acclimating to something different is hard for our kids, isn't it? So we have to be able to accommodate and modificate for them, <laughs> accommodate them in the right way, modify things for them in the right way, so that they can acclimate better once they go back to school after this six month gap, okay? So it has nothing to do with how you're teaching, if you suck or if you don't suck. That's not the point here. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is during this six month gap, you're doing what you're doing. And if it's distance learning, you're getting things like once a week and an email from your teachers. If you're getting virtual and it's mandated, then that's different. But bottom line, our kids going back to school is a huge change. So they're going to have to get acclimated. They may go through behavior issues. There may be modifications and accommodations in regards to behavior. Okay, so accommodations and modifications are for any aspect in regards to the IEP or 504. Hi, Gabby. How are you? Um, so again, layer three is some curriculum changes. That's in the classroom. That's how it's taught. All right. So what that means is grading criteria may be based on the individual goals and class participation. All right, and I'll go through these one more time after I get through it, all right? So layer four in the hierarchy of accommodations and modifications is significant changes to curriculum, all right? So if you saw, we started out at zero, now we're on level four, and things are really changing at this point. So I'm gonna go, anybody hopping on now, I'm gonna repeat this so you get it, but this is important to understand because it's how things are kind of weighed in regards to that yes or no that you get in that IEP meeting in regards to accommodations and modifications, 
All right. So layer four is students do a smaller part of the general curriculum in the gen ed setting. All right. So they're in the general education setting with the least restrictive environment, but they have a whole lot of accommodations and modifications and it's significant. OK, so grading criteria and is based off goals and class participation. All right. And it's important to understand how this goes. So now we're going to go to a level five, which is significant changes to curriculum, just like la layer four. And students do alternate, OK, activities relating to the general curriculum. And this is significant accommodations and modifications. Hi, Charlie, how are you? Yes, make sure you guys are posting a one below if you're new, a two below if you're an oldie but goodie, and don't forget notifications. Um, so the grading criteria is based on individual goals, all right, and class participation. And did you know less than 10% of special education students participating in the general ed curriculum, all right, classes, need layer four or five supports? OK, so the majority of our special needs children, our special ed students can be successful and master much of the general ed curriculum with layers two or three. OK, but less than 10 percent. I said that wrong. So hear me out here. Less than 10 percent of the special ed students participating in the general curriculum need layer four and five. All right, so let's go through these layers one more time. Hey, Lucy, how are you? Okay, so layer zero is nothing, okay? They are in the gen ed setting. They need no services, accommodations, or modifications. We're specifically talking about services and accommodations. No changes in the grading criteria. Everything is the same. And this is in the hierarchy of accommodations and modifications, layer zero. Move on to layer one, that's minimal classroom changes. And what that means, hey mom, how are you? Um, that means that all students do basically the same assignment, okay, except they receive additional support and reinforcements. So that's a minimal accommodation in the hierarchy of accommodations and modifications. So you go from zero where nothing changes, then you move to layer one where you have minimal accommodations for that student and no changes in the grading criteria is done. It's the same for everyone. And remember, an accommodation is something that is changed up in regards to giving them a support to be able to do the same work that a gen ed student, typical child, non-disabled child would receive. So it's an accommodation to say, here you go. This is something that I can give you to help you and support you have educational success in the general ed curriculum. OK, so it's something saying, hey, here you go. I hope this can help you. OK, and that's actually a good word for it. I hope this can help you because they don't always help. Right. So layer two, OK, is changes in the classroom. All right. There are classroom changes. This is still in accommodations. All right. All children and students learn the same basic content, except changes in how it is learned and tested is different. So that complex accommodation is then given. So you have a minimal accommodation as here you go. I hope this helps. And then you have the complex accommodation, which gets even more in depth of that. This is going to help because this is a more solid accommodation for you specific to your need. All right. So a basic minimal accommodation is kind of like, I hope this works. And a complex accommodation is, OK, we zeroed in on that I in the IEP, which is what? Individual, right? Because each IEP is individualized to that unique child. So that complex accommodation is really going to hone in on what their needs are based off that individuality and their goals in regards to their IEP. All right, so grading criteria may vary slightly with that complex accommodation. So layer three in the hierarchy of the... Oh, there's a, I came home late. I see that, Skylar. Okay, so level three in the hierarchy of accommodations and modifications. Oh, yes, Skylar. All right, I'll be right there, okay? 
So in the hierarchy of accommodations and modifications, layer three, there's some changes in curriculum, okay? So that's where we're changing things up a little bit more. And that includes accommodations and modifications. So some students do reduced or similar assignments, okay? So here we go, we're going into modifications. What does that mean? We're modifying what it is that gen ed, typical non-disabled students are doing to allow that child with disabilities and special needs to stay in the least restrictive environment of the gen ed classroom. However, we're not only accommodating them in a complex way, but we're also modifying what is being done in that general ed classroom and making it more specific to that child and that child's needs and what it is that they need to then have have educational success. So that could be a completely different test. It could be a completely different assignment, but yet they're still in that gen ed classroom to have that community and have that least restrictive environment, okay, which is part of IDEA and is actually against FAPE if that's not provided, as long as that's what you want, okay? So in my situation, I don't typically always want that. Uh, a more restrictive environment is actually more beneficial to my child. And I always talk to you guys about, it's not about the least restrictive environment, in my opinion. It's more about what is in the best interest of your child, where is it that your child is going to learn best, and how is that gonna happen? Okay, so you have to figure out where and then how that's going to take place. Okay, because your child can be put in the gen ed setting in PE and music and all those different things, but learn their academics in a more restrictive environment because they learn better that way. Because it's a more quieter setting, they're given, you know, more sensory um, av availability. So if they have a meltdown, they get that break, which is much needed for our kids that really have sensory based issues. And so you really have to think about what is going to work for them, not least restrictive, least restrictive, least restrictive. I've talked to a lot of parents where they're so gung ho on that, where I've had to kind of reel them back a little bit because, you know, it's not about what you want. It's about what's going to work for them. And how is it they're going to best learn and in what setting, okay? And then once you figure that out, you can figure out how that's going to take place. So you have to figure out what and where before you figure out how, okay? So just keep that in mind. Hey, Tasia, how are you? Welcome, welcome. Don't forget to post a one below if you're new, a two below if you're an oldie but goodie, and click notifications. And if you guys haven't joined the group, you guys are really missing out. <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on. Layer four, hierarchy of accommodations and modifications. That's students do a smaller part of what they're doing in the general curriculum, okay? So they're really not so much participating as much in that general curriculum academic area, but they're still there. They're still in that least restrictive environment. Typically at a level four, they have a one-on-one. -on -one and there's significant accommodations and modifications versus on level three, it was simple accommodations and modifications. Make sense? Then in that layer four, you're also looking at grading criteria is completely different. And it's based off the individual child and their goals educationally. All right, so the participation, what they do, uh, the grading is just quite different than it would be for a gen ed student and the typical report cards that they get, okay? So that's where a child is, is significantly um, impacted by their disability and yet they're still in the gen ed curriculum and setting, but everything is different in regards to what happens in that least restrictive environment, the gen ed classroom, all right? And like I said, at a level four, they typically have a one-on-one. -on -one. So a layer five in the hierarchy of accommodations and modification is students do alternative, totally different at this point, uh, activities relating to the general curriculum. So they're in the general curriculum and you know, instead of level four, they do a smaller amount of what they're doing in the general curriculum. In layer five, 
everything is different. They're not doing any of the work that the gen ed students, non-disabled students are doing. They're just literally a body in that classroom that is doing different work than they're doing in that classroom. And they're just being given the the rules and regulations in which idea upholds in regards to FAPE to allow them to be in the least restrictive environment. Level fours and level fives, it's not always ideal to be in the least restrictive environment because again, it's really just a body in a classroom not doing anything in which they're doing in that gen ed classroom. And then you're looking at your child who could possibly start feeling inadequate. Um, made to feel bad because they're not doing the same thing. You don't think that your child's going to see that what paper is given to them is different than another child? Of course they are. And, you know, as you know, our children can completely be nonverbal, but we understand everything they're trying to say. And they have feelings and they have thought processes. And to put them in a gen ed setting just because you're gung-ho on the least restrictive environment is not always in the best interest of the child, okay? So with that layer five is the grading criteria is completely different, just like layer four, where the goals and participation in class and that child's individual needs is where things are accommodated and modified, all right? So that is your hierarchy, guys, of accommodations and modifications, the difference between the two, which they're totally different, and the layers based on the effect of the general curriculum, okay? So this is important to understand. And then also you need to understand that, honestly, less than 10% of special education students participating in the general ed curriculum need layers four and five, okay? Like I just said. Four and five are typically not in the gen ed setting because it's not ideal for them. And that's okay, all right? The majority of our special ed students who can pretty much be successful in the gen ed curriculum are at the layers zero through three. Four and five, it is more ideal in most situations to be in a more restrictive environment so that they have all the accommodations, modifications, and all their needs met in one area. And for them not to feel that tug of being put in a category different from others and it being very visual. Visual, did I even say that right? <laughs> visual. So that child is going to know that they're doing something completely different than a child with non-disabilities, and that's not cool. So you want to make sure that within your layers, you know your child's layer, you know your child's layer going into the school system this coming year. That may have changed from last year. You cannot be thinking that way. That's why I said this year, this summer, you cannot take an IEP vacation. You have to be on it. You have to be doing what we were doing over in the group and the IEP challenge in regards to recording your child. It's not right now. If it's not in writing, it never happened. No, for you to properly, you are the teacher now. So for you to to properly take solid data, okay, you have to record because you have to have it in, in, in a way that they can visually see it because they don't see your children right now. So to be able to take data, you have to have it recorded. And I think I told you guys, I spoke to the attorney um, the other day um, from the case in 2017 where they won in the Supreme Court in regards to goals and progress being sufficient instead of minimal. And you want to make sure that where your child is, is accommodated, where they are, they are learning, where they are, they are making progress, that their goals are smart, and everything in that IEP is where it needs to be. And your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted and everything's together, which is probably why I am overwhelmed right now with IEP makeovers um, because everybody's like, okay, I got several months before my child starts school again. I'm getting my IEP cleaned up. I am cleaning my IEP house. And so that's what we're doing. <laughs> but you know what? Share this if you think it's important information. A lot of people really need to understand the difference between accommodations and modifications. And many people don't even know that there was a hierarchy of accommodations and modifications and that there's levels in which your child falls. And more than likely, you know what that is. But if you don't, 
that's okay. It's easy to figure out. Message me below if you have questions. And know that these levels may just change between where they were last year or this year that's finishing and coming up, the year coming up. Children regress. They lose knowledge and the repetitiveness of things that are done in school, which is even in the gen ed curriculum, you know, when teachers teach, usually that first nine weeks, a lot of it is just kind of remembering what they did the year before, which is is kind of backwards in my opinion. I think that um, the, if the child mastered it, they shouldn't have to go review it again and again that first quarter. Um, but children with special needs do need that. And so they're able to really be provided what is needed for them. And uh, because uh, children with special needs and disabilities need that in all actuality, keeping it real and transparent, that's why most children with special needs need ESY. And remember, guys, ESY is not off the table. If your school system, your state, and everything opens and your governor reopens things and things are ready to go, ESY is not off the table. It does not matter if, if summer school's in play. Two have nothing to do with each other. So if your governor lifts things, then ESY is in play. And you have, for those parents who have had trouble getting ESY, Y'all, now is the time to go after it because you have every reason to go after it, all right? And especially if you're doing the IEP challenge and taking that documentation and writing it down that you're recording and taking your notes and every week emailing the team, sending the impactful videos that show regression or, for example, regression could be they wrote a certain way when school ended and now they're writing a different way. That's not so great. That is regression. Those are impactful videos or a behavior issue that never presented itself that now all of a sudden is happening and that's not fun or cool for you. And it's something that shows a differentiation of what's happening while your child's at home, which is data that you're taking by video that you're sending to them. And say it like that in your weekly emails. If you guys are following me with the IEP challenge over in the group, if you haven't joined, get over there. You gotta join. That's where everybody kind of asks questions and posts their stuff. Um, Give me one second, Gracie. Um, so make sure that you guys stay focused on that, all right? Um, so ESY is um, extended school year. So it's when your child can actually have school um, provided to them during the summer. And that can be a variety of ways. Don't allow the school to just say, oh, we just offer it from 10 to 2. That is crap. Not true. It's based off your child's individual unique needs. My child has literally been provided therapeutic writing and more. So just know that that whole 10 to 2 or whatever it is that they say is not all that they can provide for ESY. Again, think about the first letter in the IEP and what that means. So make sure you focus on that. Make sure you know your difference between accommodations and modifications, which you should now, and you know your layers. And the next thing is, is you want to make sure that you're fully prepared for next year to start and your child is ready to roll. So clean your IEP house, message me if you need to, set up a free discovery call, and make sure that everything's put together so you're not losing your ever-loving mind come August, September. Okay, so post your questions below. If you're watching the replay, welcome. Post a one below if you're new, a two below if you're an oldie but goodie. Make sure you say hi, don't be a stranger. So hopefully that answered your question, Gracie. It's extended school year. It's a continu continuation of school throughout the summer so that your child does not regress and many other things. It's not just regression. We've talked about that in detail here on the lives but regression is kind of like that first thing that people think about. Um, but it could be anything, okay? It could be behavior issues, anything that is a significant reason for them to continue with schooling during the summer, okay? And it could be a need that needs addressed simply. That's it. It may not even be academics. It could be that they're going to get behavior therapy or ABA therapy for the summer. It could be where they do a drama, a special needs drama program or therapeutic writing. It, 
it's just like the IEP, guys. You can put anything under the sun in an IEP. You can say that they're going to be given a boat to be able to go on the water to get some sort of service or accommodation because that's what their child needs. That's kind of an extension of things, right? But that's literally how extensive the IEP is. You can put anything in an IEP, any accommodation, any modification, any service, okay? If I'm doing one-on-one -on -one with my son at home for writing and helping, can I request a one-on-one -on -one when they return to school? <laughs> uh, no, um, but you can use what you're doing if you're recording them to persuade in my PPPN, right? My trademark PPPN, does everybody know what that means? Plan, prepare, persuade, present, and negotiate, which is what you do in the IEP meeting, which is what I teach in my course. So you have to know how to plan and prepare in the right way to create your plan of action to then take action, which is then presenting and persuading. So you actually have a good presentation and a way that you actually could persuade in a really good way, Charlie, which is if you're going by the challenge over in the group, which is record, take notes. You just said in your statement to me, if I'm doing one-on-one -on -one with my son at home for writing, all right, which writing isn't really the significant thing that you want to say. However, you want to persuade them that having somebody there with him on a one-on-one -on -one basis is helping him, supporting him, and providing him a accommodation or modification so that he can thrive and make educational progress. So that one-on-one -on -one is going to be given to him all right, as a modification or a service. And the reason it's going to be given to him is because his impact of disability is somehow compromised based on not having a one-on-one. -on -one. See what I'm saying? So you've got to figure out that argument to where it's objective versus subjective. Objective is when you have data and stuff to back it up. And subjective is when we're always right, us parents, we're always right because our gut is always right typically with our kids. But subjective data, our thoughts of my child needs speech and my child needs this and my child needs that. That subjective data, which again, moms, dads, we are always right <laughs> typically when it comes to our kids. But that subjective data is going to get you the no and not the yes. Okay, so you have to be able to plan and prepare to create that plan of action. Then you present and persuade, which is taking action on your planning and preparing, which is creating that plan of action, and then negotiate if you have to, okay? So hopefully that answers your question, Charlie. I'm going to jump off here, okay? I just recorded um, my first video in my service accommodation and modification mini course. So I have been on the computer now 33 minutes here, and it took me 45 minutes to record that one video. <laughs> so I am done. But hopefully you guys got a lot out of the air hierarchy of accommodations and modifications. Hopefully you got... Um, some understanding of what those layers mean and that you're able to um, take the right steps in making sure that your children get the right modifications and accommodations come this new year because again they may be quite different all right no problem charlie and make sure you guys hopping on and catching the replay post a one below if you're new to blow if you're an oldie but goodie and i will most likely see you guys tomorrow if not tuesday have a good night. Bye-bye.